everybody. Thank you for joining me. Um, it's Thursday and for um, every Thursday this month, I do have a portion of our live series on Facebook and YouTube. And this is my No Better, So Better series. Uh, I've given this, well, this was kind of based on a lecture um, that I've been giving to quilt guilds for years now. Um, when people ask about, you know, lectures that have to do with machine maintenance, keeping your machine going, user errors. Um, I put together this program several years ago, and um, it's kind of more the preventive, preventative, <laughs> preventative measure side of things. So I don't do, uh, go into a lot of um, troubleshooting here, but I do a lot of um, pre, before you get in trouble, let's do some preventative measures to keep you out of trouble. So um, this is a program I've been presenting to guilds for years. And I'll admit that when I first started doing this program, it was really, really mentally difficult for me to find my rhythm because I would go to, into it thinking, I'm standing in front of this room of, you know, 50 or 60 women that have been sewing. Some of them have been sewing longer than I've been alive. And that's a very intimidating measure when um, going into that situation. But I learned that even those that thought that they already knew everything I'd present, I was approached so many times after my lecture hearing, you know, no one ever told me those things. No one taught me that. I didn't know that. Um, and I think a lot of that is because in our culture, as we know it, as far as sewing machine service and repair goes, most people don't have access to a technician that's willing to take the time to show you what's going on with your machine, to educate you on what the different parts are doing, to help you be a better sewist rather than just knowing that they did something to your machine and now it works. Um, that was kind of a pet peeve of mine before I was servicing machines. I remember very specifically taking my machine in and it was like a $300 Singer computerized machine. And the note came back and all it said was wrong bobbin and machine. It didn't tell me anything about what they did to my machine. It didn't tell me what bobbin I should be using if the wrong bobbin caused any issues. So I've always taken that approach with my customers in our shop to if I can help you do things better at home, I will always do that. So this series um, is kind of encompassing that. When we do these weekly live series, they will be combined and expanded upon and become an actual standalone program that we will offer for free um, called No Better, Sell Better. And our tagline to that is um, things that your um, grandmother didn't know and Google isn't telling you. And that's because those are sometimes our two biggest resources when learning to sew or quilt is um, another person in our family or a friend or Google um, you know, or YouTube. YouTube is fantastic for, for teaching us things, um, but there's a lot of little things that get missed. So that's kind of what I'm kind of what I'm covering in this series. Today we're talking about proper threading of your machine, which this is, um, as I've mentioned before, this is one that I get an eye roll um, a lot of times from my customers, but sometimes, um, especially when we're tired and we don't have good threading habits, it's so easy, um, especially if you're new to sewing, to miss something. So that's what I'm going to cover today. We're going to talk about in, uh, inserting the bobbin correctly. That is usually a big issue um, for new sewists. And in case you are new to my channel, I am Andy Barney, and I am um, a professional technician. I've been doing this work for over 13 years now. Um, and more importantly, I am empowering other people to know how to take care of their machines themselves, to understand better and um, have a little more control, uh, especially as we move into an era where we're, we have a lack of technicians. So we're, it's going to be kind of on ourselves to do better. Uh, at the end of this, I will. Uh, we do have a handout for each week. And this week's has the cover on it, so we'll have pages that we'll add to it um, for the next two weeks. And it's just kind of an expansion on what I talk about in the live series and some reference points. So I will be happy to give that to you. There's no email address required. It's a free download. Um, and the, if you're watching the replay or if you're watching live, feel free to leave uh, comments or questions if you have issues or questions about your specific machine, I'm happy to go back and answer them. So even if you're watching the replay, if you leave a comment with a question, I will go back and check. Um, I don't know how well answering live questions will go. I will do my best, but sometimes um, Facebook or YouTube doesn't always show me the feed. So if you have asked a question during my live and I haven't answered it, I promise I'm not ignoring you. It's just the way the feed works. So I will go back and answer your question. All right. So I'm going to get started. I admitted that I do pre-record the learning portion of these. Otherwise, we would be here for three hours while I try to shuffle machines around and because I like to give you several examples. So I'm going to go ahead and get that started and I will take some questions. 
I do want to talk about universal threading rules. There are some rules that doesn't matter what home domestic sewing machine you're using, whether it's new or old, that have to be done in order for you to successfully sew with your machine. Okay, so number one, your presser foot is always going to be up when you're threading your machine. That's this lever back here that, that raises your presser foot up and down. And what happens is when you raise your presser foot up, it is actually opening up the tension discs. And I will show you this in a vintage machine, but it's actually opening up the tension discs that are right in here. Um, and in fact, on this machine, you won't be able to see it with the camera, but um, when I lift the presser foot up and down, you can see, I can see the tension discs. I can just see light changing where they're opening and closing. So when you pr put your presser foot up, it opens the tension discs. And then when you thread it and put your foot down, it closes the tension disc. That's what puts proper tension on your on your upper thread and that's what this dial does. So first universal rule is you have to thread your machine with the presser foot up. Otherwise you're gonna have tension issues, thread nesting, all kinds of issues, all right? Number two is you have to hit every single thread guide on this path. Now, thankfully most um, modern machines do have notes on the path that you can follow. But when I'm talking about a thread guide, so you can see up here on the threading, even though this is for bobbin winding, there it's here too. You actually go from the spool to the thread guide, um, then over here, and then as you go down your path, you're gonna see there's another thread guide at the needle. So every machine is oriented different, but the path is generally the same. As long as there is a thread guide, your thread must go through it. So rule number three when threading your machine is that you have to make sure your thread makes it into the take-up lever. Now, it's a little harder to see in this machine because a lot of our modern machines, this stuff is behind plastic. But as I'm turning the hand wheel, you can probably see that piece of silver moving in there. That is called the take-up lever. What happens is when you're sewing and your needle goes down and it's coming back up, you can see they kind of move in opposite directions between that and the tension up here, that obviously pulls the thread up, but it keeps your threads from snapping. So if you miss this, your, your thread's not going to work properly. So when you're threading, make sure it's going through that, um, that upper uh, take-up lever. On vintage machines, you can actually see the parts that are inside on a plastic machine. So some of you that have not seen um, vintage machines and don't know how the things on the inside of your machine works. Uh, this is what I'm going to cover in this section. So first I want to talk about, this is a huge enigma. People ask all the time why it's important that your presser foot be up when you're threading and down when you're sewing. And it's beautifully illustrated in here because you can see everything that's happening. So let me zoom in here. And right now the presser foot is down. So when we're threading, we're going to lift up on the presser foot and it's going to be very small movements but what you're going to see when we put the presser foot let me put it back down when the presser foot is down what you see in here is this little lever and when i put the presser foot up it moves forward and this little piece here hits a little pin inside there it's probably really hard to see but what you can see is you can see movement up here in the front that's your tension discs opening and closing let's see if i can get a good angle so if you can see that movement this little gold piece is moving. Now, right here, see there's some wiggle room. And now if I drop the presser foot, there's no wiggle room. So that's why it's really important for your presser foot to be up when you're threading. The other piece is the take-up lever here that we talked about. Um, when you turn the hand wheel, that's the piece that goes up and down. And it does thread slightly differently on most vintage machines. So let's go through the threading process. So here we have a Singer Quantum Stylus, which is a really popular modern singering machine. Um, and I want to show this one because there are numerous brands and designs that are very similar to this. If you look up here at the top, you still have thread guides and things, but they look a little different. So I wanted to walk through proper threading of this machine. So we're going to first put our spool on the the thing now with this this <clears throat> machine gives you a couple options i almost never use this tilted because it's going to pull it back down anyway really but 
um, you can get your spool on there. And typically you want it so that the thread is coming from behind to the front. I don't know if that makes sense, but you can see it's wrapping this way. So I'm going to get this on there. And if you have a spool cap, it's good to use. This machine doesn't have one with it. Don't think it'll be a problem. But you're going to go through, and thankfully, most of these machines with these plastic guides have actual images, which the camera is probably not going to pick up, that tells you what you need to do. So you're going to hold some tension here, and you're going to go through the first thread guide. It's going to wrap around through this other thread guide. It's going to come down. Now, these are your tension discs in here that we talked about. You're going to continue to bring your thread down. I do like to keep some tension up here so you're not just pulling lengths of thread through but you're gonna follow down and on every machine like this, you're gonna loop back up and this is gonna take it through the tension discs. There is a check spring, what they call a check spring back here behind this. And you will you can actually feel it spring a little bit. If you hold tension with your right hand and pull on this a little bit, you might be able to feel a little bit of a spring give there. And you're gonna continue back up and feed thread over here on your right hand as you need to. Um, and you're going to loop back around. Now, make sure, again, your needle is all the way up, but you're going to see, you can't see it, but there is an upper, what they call an upper looper. It's the metal piece. I don't think this snaps on. It's the metal piece that um, goes up and down on the machine, but on these plastic machines, you can't see them. And then you're going to come all the way back down. And I don't have a presser foot on here, but that's not going to matter for threading. But now we're all the way down here. Before I thread through the needle, what I like to do to make sure we hit these tension discs, remember your presser foot is up. I'm going to drop, I'm gonna hold my thread with my left hand, put the presser foot down, and then you should not be able to easily pull this thread. You don't wanna yank on anything, but pull it and make sure there's resistance. If there's resistance, like you can't easily pull this, that means your thread is locked into the upper tension disc the way they should be. Now, if I release this and pull on it, you can see the thread moves pretty easily. So do that every single time, and that's gonna save you frustration. If you're getting loops on the bottom of your fabric or thread nesting, it's typically because there's an issue where either you missed, um, you might've thread with your presser foot down, or something is happening up here that it's not getting proper tension. So now that we're down here at the end, we're going to go through, if you have any thread guides, machines are different. This one has a little tiny thread guide right here at the needle post. Some of them have them on the side, but you're going to go through, you have to use that thread guide. Otherwise, you're going to have broken stitches and some issues. And now I'm going to clip my thread and I'm going to take it through the needle. And that's how you thread the upper thread on this machine. So I have a Brother SQ9285 here, which is one of a million different variations that Brother has put out. So this will cover a huge number of machines that are set up similarly. It doesn't really matter the brand and the model. I just want to give you different examples of thread guides and how it looks different. But if you follow this concept, you'll start to notice where all the thread guides are on your machine and how the path works. So we're going to start with our thread up here on the spool. If your machine has the spool back here on the back right, regardless of whether it's down here or up here, um, you're always going to have a thread guide that draws it over to that first point. So whereas up, if yours is up here, like you saw in the other example, if it's up front, it's going to have a thread guide also, but in a different place. But there's always going to be a thread guide that, that moves the thread over to this path. So we're going to put our thread on the spool and this, you know, I always like for the thread to come off the back. So it kind of winds in, I don't know how, what direction you would call this, but it kind of winds this way. All right. So get that on your spool. If you have one of these with the spool pin in the back, you're probably going to have to have a spool pin on it to keep it on there, not vibrate off. So you're going to undo a little bit of length of thread. And we're going to go through, I'm going to tilt this up so you can see. We're going to go through this first thread guide. So you're going to just snap it in and then you can see there's even a picture telling you to thread this through. So I keep a little tension on the, the thread with my right hand and you're just going to guide it through this up here. And now we're in our thread path. So make sure your presser foot is up. Very important that your presser foot is up. So these tension discs right here, your tension discs are in this space. If you find your um, dial, the tension discs are going to be really close by. So before I go any further, now that I have it through, 
what I like to do at this stage is go ahead and put my presser foot down. And I'm going to just gently pull on the thread. There's resistance. If you have no resistance at all, then there may be an issue with your tension disc that you need to get checked out. When you lift up the presser foot, you can see I can easily pull this thread. Okay. So now we're going to, now that we know that's okay, we're going to come up. And again, if you put your presser foot down and you pull on this, you can feel a little spring now. You can feel that spring that's behind this plastic engage. If yours is really hard to move through there with the presser foot up. So if I, with the presser foot up, if I draw this up, it moves very smoothly. If yours feels like it's catching, you may have an issue with the spring and you need to have service. All right. So on our next step, we have the needle bar in the upper position. And the, you can see there's a take-up lever. The camera is probably not going to pick that up. But in the demonstration, I showed you the take-up lever. As long as you loop around what you see in there, you're going to hit that take-up lever. And then you're going to come back down. And again, we have that last thread guide right here at the needle. Almost all machines have a thread guide at the needle. There's a few exceptions in the Singer family especially. But almost every machine I can think of has a some type of thread guide at the needle. And it's very important that you hit that. And then from here, we're going to thread our needle. If I can do that around the camera. And then you're going to draw that under your foot. And that's how you thread these machines in similar. So I want to give you a demonstration on what this looks like inside of a machine. Um, I know there's a lot of terms that have not really been made common for us because technicians don't take the time to talk about it. So I want to make sure you understand what's happening in the machine. When you thread your machine and you come around and I'm talking about it being in a take-up lever, it's actually this piece here. So when you turn your hand wheel or when your machine is running, that is how the take-up lever moves. And you can see it kind of moves in rhythm with the needle, but it's not like they're going up and down simultaneously. But that's what guides um, how much pressure and where the thread is to form the stitch. So it is very important that your thread end up coming through there. So there is a thread guide up here and I'm going to come around to here. My presser foot is up. I'm going to bring it down. So when we take it up, there is actually, I'll show you this too. So when you bring the thread back up and this is going on behind the plastic, you can actually see that this is called the check spring. Um, and that when you pull on the spring or on the thread, it actually activates that spring. So it goes through that spring. So when you're in that spring, which if you're if you're following this, it's going to naturally go into that spring. You're going to bring your thread around that plastic. And so this is what's happening behind that plastic when you're threading your machine. It's actually falling into that little space in the um, in the upper looper. I'm sorry, in the take up lever. So it's actually threading through the take up lever up here. And that's happening behind the plastic. Um, so then you're going to go down and finish into the thread guide. But this is what it looks like. And then remembering our rules, if I drop the presser foot, now I have tension and I can't easily, it'll pull on the string, but I can't easily pull the thread. So that's what's happening up here inside your machine if you have one with a plastic cover. All right, so let's go through, through threading on vintage machines. And again, they're all going to look a little different. This one's got a few more steps in it because it is in the 500 series. But we have our thread spools up here. And one thing I want to note is that this machine is specifically built to handle double threads. So you're going to see two different spool pins. And there's actually a place for a third. But down here in the tension disc, instead of just having two discs that close, there's actually three plus the base. So you can add two threads through two different tension discs. So we're just going to do the one thread. My needle is um, bar, this, the needle is all the way up. So my take up lever is up here and my presser foot is up, always up when threading. So we're going to follow to the first thread guide, which is up here at the top. Now this one has a slightly different setup. This is different here. You would not have probably this complex of a step. You would just have one thread guide. But on the slant needle series, there is an extra thread guide. So it just goes through the thread guide here. And then it comes down and it goes into, you want to make sure it's between tension discs, not the edges, but you'll see two tension discs in there. And I'm going to put some pressure. What I like that you can see on here, this is the same thing that's going on inside your plastic machine, but it's actually an external check spring. So what you see here is that spring we were looking at inside of the plastic brother machine. So 
what we're going to do here is going to put some tension on the thread up the top with your right hand and you're going to draw this up and you can see the tension spring rising and it's going to slip my thread behind that little tiny hook all right and now i now i can with tension up here on the thread where i uh, on the with my right hand you can pull on this and you can feel the same spring that you see in the brother machine if i let go up my thread is just going to pull it through so once that's in there keep tension with your right hand on that spool and then draw it around the thread guide and then you're going to bring it up to the top and now we're at the take up lever this take up lever has has a hole in it so you can't um, slip it behind anything you actually thread it through the take up lever hole and then we're going to draw it back down keep following your thread path then there's another thread uh, guide down here so let's get it through this thread guide another thread guide here and then one more here so you have to make sure you hit every single one of these thread guides regardless of what machine you're using and now i'm going to thread it through the needle actually if we're going to follow our rules let's go ahead and hold the tail with our left hand drop the presser foot and now i should you can see the tension spring moving here but i'm not able to pull the thread through because these tension discs have it locked this is exactly what i want to be able to do if i lift my presser foot i can pull this thread super easy so that's always your test. And now I'm going to go ahead and thread through the needle because I know that my upper threading is good. And then we're going to tuck it under our presser foot. And then we'll load our bobbin. Now we're going to go through properly inserting the bobbin on um, this. This is a Singer Quantum Stylus, but many of your modern plastic shell machines are very similar to this where you can see the bobbin case in here but um it's got kind of a guide so we have our bobbin and we're going to cover specifics on bobbins in week three or part three which is um how to make sure you're using the correct bobbin but for today we're just going to talk about threading so i have my wound bobbin and i'm using red so you can see a little bit better but for drop-in bobbins, it's almost a universal rule that when you put your bobbin in, it needs to be winding counterclockwise. So you can see the way the thread is winding onto the, onto the bobbin is counterclockwise. If you put it in the wrong way, you're going to have all kinds of stitch issues. So I get this a lot with my newer customers that are fairly new to sewing, where um, they don't realize that this has to be inserted. Now this machine doesn't have it, um, not even on the case, but sometimes on our modern machines, there's either a little sticker over here to the side, or sometimes the little bobbin cover will have a little graphic that reminds you that this needs to go wind counterclockwise. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna place your bobbin in there. And once it's in there, you're going to take your thread and there is a little notch. Let me see. I'll, I will post a picture so that you can see what I'm talking about. But there's a little notch that puts the thread into the to the uh, tension and you're going to pull on it. So you can see it just slips behind that little silver. Um, there's a little silver lip here and now I can pull it smoothly. Now, some machines have an entire path over here and I'll show you an example in a future one where it has a path where you wind through and it cuts the thread i always leave my tail here and what i like to do even if you have an automatic thread cutter um, even if you have the path that it guides you through to cut it leave your tail then you're going to hold the tail of your upper thread and you're going to turn your hand wheel toward you let the needle go below the plate and you're going to see it pick up the bobbin thread and pull it around and it's going to give you both tails so you have them above the needle plate. I always, when I put a new bobbin in or have to rethread the bobbin, I always, always do this and start my sewing off with both tails at the top. So again, if you have that little thread path, ignore it. Just do it this way, and that will give you cleaner stitches and less tension issues as you get started on your sewing. And then, of course, when you're done, you would put your plate back on your machine. So now we're going to cover doing the bobbin on the modern brother. Um, this is not just for brother. This also would be baby lock. There's so many that use this design, but I want to show you um, what I'm talking about with the thread path. So let me zoom in down here. 
and I have our bobbin already wound and I used red thread so you can see what's going on. Um, again, now on this machine, there's actually an illustration that you can see here and it's a bobbin and it's showing you that the, the thread is winding counterclockwise and then it goes through the thread path here. Now this particular machine has this piece of plastic that's covering the actual tension spring in the bobbin case. Uh, I think this is both blessing, blessing and a curse because maybe in theory it keeps thread and lint from getting down into the tension and affecting your tension. However, I feel like it kind of cheats the customer because you're really just using their guide instead of seeing the bobbin case itself. So here's what I like to do, and this is my personal rule, anytime I have a customer's machine that I need to test it with to find out what's going on. Because if you don't do this part correctly, you will have um, terrible results. So we're gonna drop our bobbin in, and it has you drawing it around this plastic piece, which means it's going into the tension of the bobbin. And normally it has you going this way where it breaks off the thread. Then you put your cover on and you start sewing. I think that this starts off, this is where a lot of issues happen. When you're starting off with this thread this way, your first stitches are really garbled and gross looking, but also it does sometimes take a while for the machine to sort itself out. So I have a different rule. Um, I almost never, ever, ever use these guides. Even on my personal sewing, I always do this method. So you're gonna drop your bobbin in and you're still gonna have to draw this around, but we're gonna stop here and leave a tail. And then we're gonna take and hold the upper thread tail with our left hand, make sure it's under your foot. You're gonna take the hand wheel, you're gonna turn it toward you, take it all the way down and back up. And then it's gonna pull up, you just saw it catch the bobbin thread and it's gonna pull up that bobbin thread and now you have both your tails up here at the top. So even if there's an automatic thread cutter um, or what have you, I do this method every single time so that I have control of both these threads when I start sewing. Especially if you're having issues with your machine and you're trying to figure out the issue, this is gonna eliminate any issues with it trying to catch that thread. I will also say if you're using a modern machine that has a needle up down, when you um, get to this point where you drop your bobbin in and you feed it through and you have your tail, you can hit the the threader, or I'm sorry, the um, needle up down, and it's going to automatically drop the needle down and you'll hit it again and bring it back up. And it's going to do the same thing that I just did here manually. This machine's not plugged in, so I can't show you that feature, but it's going to give you the exact same result. And then you're going to put your cover on and you're ready to sew. All right, so on our bobbin threading for the Singer 503, Normally I would use a metal bobbin in here, a, sing, a class 66. Um, you can use plastic, but sometimes you'll get a little bit of static effect with the plastic rubbing on the metal. But honestly, either one is really fine. I just want you to be able to see the thread. So I'm using a plastic one with red thread. So you're going to like the other ones, drop your bobbin in. You're gonna have it going the exact same position we talked about. Your thread is winding counterclockwise. Um, the only exceptions I can think of for this is the Elna machine. On an Elna, your bobbin case is in the back and it winds the opposite. It's gonna go, um, you're still gonna put it in the same position, but it's gonna go the other way. So I can't really think of a machine that's top loading where the thread goes a different way. So it's safe to assume you're gonna drop your bobbin in with your thread coming off, uh, winding to counterclockwise. So we're gonna drop this in and you're gonna see, and you should be able to see on the edge of your bobbin case, there's going to be a little metal lip right here, an edge, and you're going to draw your thread under that and pull it out to the left. So now you can see my thread is under that little metal piece. So that's, and if I pull up, it stays in there. So again, you're going to leave yourself a bit of a tail. I'm going to hold my um, upper thread tail with my left hand. I'm going to turn the hand wheel always toward you, never away from you. Pull up that thread. You can see it wrap around and you can grab your scissors or some tweezers and pull these threads up. Now you have both threads, um, the top and bottom, in your left hand ready to sew. And then you're just going to close your needle plate. So let's talk about how to insert the bobbin correctly on a machine that is either front loading or side loading. So that's what we mean by front loading or side loading. The other one we talked about is drop in, which means the bobbin goes drops into top. 
Um, this is a Singer Tradition, which is a very basic, probably one of Singer's most basic machines you can purchase. Um, and they commonly are front loading. Uh, the Singer Simple, I think the, uh, even the patchwork model, I think is front loading. And then on your side loading, a lot of the more advanced, like heavier duty machines like Juki, Brother has a similar model that loads on the side. Um, and then you have a lot of vintage machines that do load on the side. So this is going to cover um, basically getting your bobbin inserted correctly every single time. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to start by taking the bobbin case out and you just use a little latch there on the front and it does snap. You don't have to use the latch to put it in, but it is there if you're, if you're having issues, it does just snap in, but you just pull that little lever out a little bit. And if you pull the lever and then pull it out by the lever, it'll release every time. All right. So what I have here, this machine takes a class 15. Almost every single um, front and side loading machine takes a class 15 bobbin. Your exceptions to that are going to be um, Viking and Foff. And I think that's really your biggest exceptions. Um, if you have a specialty machine that uses a, like a class L, it may be different, but um, most of your vintage, oh, I can tell you almost certainly that all vintage Japanese machines that are front and side loading, um, like an Atlas or a Deluxe or any of the numerous um, versions you see, they do use class 15 and class 15 bobbins cases. Okay. So in this machine, it uses a plastic class 15, which is what I have here. And I do have red thread in here, so you can easily see what I'm doing. Um, and we're going to talk about how to insert this properly. So the first thing I want you to do is take a look at your bobbin case. Um, and I want you to know what parts are on here. So you have the lash that we talked about. The other big thing to note is this big metal plate that goes across the top here. And you can kind of see the seam edge on it. Otherwise, with it being all metal and a glare, it's hard to see. This is actually your tension spring. Um, and it's not a spring in what we think of in traditional springs, but basically when you tighten this screw here, it puts more pressure on this plate and this is where your thread comes out. So this is what determines how much um, tension your bobbin is getting, all right? So when you look at your um, bobbin case, what's important to know is, is the outlet on the left or on the right? On this particular bobbin case, it's on my left. And this is important because this is going to determine what direction you put your thread in. And I will have this in the handout. There's a quick reference um, in there for you. So if you're looking like this one, if your thread, uh, the tensioner is on the left side, then your thread needs to wind clockwise. So when I say that, if you look at the way the thread is winding on the spool, it's winding clockwise or to my right. Okay. And it gets inserted that way. And then you pull the thread back through and draw it through the tension until it comes out in that little spot. So if you can see, it's coming out on this side. Okay, as another example, what I have here is a customer's featherweight bobbin. And I pulled this one just because it's an easy example. Um, there are class 15 cases that do um, have the spring on the opposite side, depending on the setup of the machine. But I wanted to have an example of what it looks like when the tension spring is on the other side. So if you look at how this one is set up, there's actually two screws and the spring now ends on the right side. So when you're inserting your bobbin into a bobbin case where the tensioner ends on the right side, your thread needs to be winding counterclockwise. So again, I have a reference for this in the handout that you can, um, put with your machine so that you have a reminder if you need to. Um, but you're going to insert this as it's winding counterclockwise. So once you insert it into the bobbin case, you're going to draw the thread to the right and through that tension spring. And now you can see it's coming out of that side. I want to say that there might be a few exceptions and they're very rare. There's like two models of Bernina's where it's the opposite, but please refer to your manual. But this is almost a fail safe way to load your bobbin properly every time. Um, and if you have any questions, if you have a machine that you're unsure of, or you're having issues, feel free to comment or um, even send me a message and I'm happy to help you figure out how you should be loading your bobbin. Yeah, well, and to reiterate, this is very important that they are loaded properly. If you have your bobbin in backward, you're going to have tension issues, broken threads, looping, thread nesting, 
it's uh, the symptoms are going to be different, but you're, you're not going to get successful stitches. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and put this back in the machine. And then you would thread like we talked about before. And then next week we're going to cover. Forget all that. All right, so um, as I mentioned, if you have questions, please feel free to leave them and I will go back and answer them. I did want to point out that Heidi gratefully had uh, mentioned I did twice accidentally call the take up lever an upper looper, which is part of a surgery. I was working on a very intense surgery just before doing videos. So that's why I wanted to keep calling it um, an upper looper for some reason. So thank you for pointing that out and just know it is a take up lever. Um, it does get confusing in sewing machine parts sometimes because there's so many terms that um, depending on how you learn them as a technician, what they're called, but it is a take up lever. Um, so as a reminder, if you would like a handout, um, please leave a comment and I will drop a link for you. And I mentioned that um, I do have a lot of reference on what I talked about in here, especially as far as loading bobbins. I would say when it comes to threading, two of the biggest issues that we have with um, some of our newer sewists is one, using the wrong bobbin, which I will cover in week three. Um, very deeply because that's a tough one. And then also inserting it in the wrong direction. Um, even if, especially if you have multiple machines that you switch around. Um, I know a lot of people do a lot of things with machines and it's really easy to forget what you need to do for each machine. So I have all of that referenced in the handout and I will get a link to you. And all of these will be compiled um, so that you'll have access to them. If you missed them today, they're not going anywhere. Nothing's going to expire. Um, and again, no email address. It's all free. So thank you all for joining me. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. My contact information is also on the front of the handout so that if you're having a specific issue or you're not sure about threading your machine, um, you can post pictures. I'm happy to answer them. Send me an email. I will be glad to help you with any um, any issues with um, you know your machine. And I see that Dawn's asking about uh, mentioning which direction the needles are threaded. I did not in this one. Um, in week three, I will go into in depth a little bit about needle position. That is also a concern. For um, for a quick reference, any machine, most modern machines are um, thread front to back. But I do have some uh, graphs that we're going to do in week three. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.